Hi, and thanks for watching. I am Jennifer Texera. I'm going to go through uh, the ritual of Temple of the Bones. And this was uh, in my book uh, by the same name. I just want to go through the different parts of the book as we use them in ritual space. So this is a guide to kind of help you uh, lead your own circles. Temple of the Bones was led by witches, and I do have a high priestess background, so um, it's a little easier for me to do the rituals, just because I've had experience leading rituals for many years. But what um, Hecate will teach us is you need to take one step forward and get on the path of practice. If you have the devotion to the goddess in your heart, you will be able to do a little bit every day, every month, however you work. I do recommend um, having a daily practice and making a connection to the goddess. And um, that's what I do. I have a daily practice. I will um, wake up and I will do that. I will, before I go to bed, I will have another practice that I do. Um, sometimes this is like a lot of people call the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. It's a very popular one. Look it up. I'm not going to get into it right now, but that is, um, a favorite option for a lot of people who went to the temple. But right now I'm going to go over the circle cast. So our ritual is open to the public. Anyone would come in, but we, that didn't mean we didn't, we invited every energy in. Our circle cast was a little bit different in that we called in the elements um, uh, later on, uh, the elements of Hakate specifically, but the circle cast was more fluid. You could do different things. And I'm just going to go over a couple of the favorite things right now. Um, I'm going to bring out one skull. Now this is a skull that uh, would be passed around the circle to um, engage everyone in the ritual for them to understand um, what kind of magic we're doing so that they can look at themselves, uh, the reality of self, that we have a limited time in our bodies and that we are gathering together in community to create change, not just in our lives, but in our community around us. So in the area we were, and it's going, might be specific to your area, uh, we were in Oakland in the Lake Merritt area, and um, there was a lot of, there's, you know, a lot of crime. It's Oakland. Um, that's a saying we had, well, you know, is my car safe to park here? I mean, it is Oakland, so no, but um, park at your own risk, really. Um, but we would offer a lot of work, ancestor work. So this skull, um, and others like it, has been passed around. Now, if you don't have a skull as elaborate, there are smaller kinds of representatives. And I've had other people ask or say, well, I use real skulls in my work. And it's like, well, um, we do sometimes, but I'm not going to pass around a real skull of someone I don't know. Um, so if there's a donation of a skull from a witch, then I might take it, but I might not. Uh, it really doesn't matter. I just need the representation. And passing it around a circle of 50 people is going to damage the skull uh, eventually. So I'm not going to pass it in a public type of space. So you do you, but I'm not doing that. Energetically and physically is going to damage that tool. Um, I would use that for private practice if that was something that I wish to do. So the skull representative of the ancestors, representative of ourselves and our inner power, representative of the bones within, um, the foundation of who we are, our DNA, our practice, who we are as witches, um, is very representative in that part. Also engaging everyone in the circle. So that was a big part of our circle was making sure everyone had a role um, or maybe not a role as a as a witch leading a circle, but as a even a participant should have an active engagement with the ritual that they're doing. 
So that was one. The, the skull is one of my favorites. Um, another common one, because we, we do have witches that um, have ceremonial experience and other experience in other work, uh, we have the ceremonial athame or blade. Hakate is known to carry a blade to cut the cord of life. So this is when you're born. Uh, the cord is cut between you and your mother. And when you die, the cord is cut between you and your life. So here is a symbol. It's representative of that journey. Um, when you're cut using this blade, you're cutting uh, a circle around. Now, not everyone would be using this blade. It would, it might be, I'm not going to pass my own blade usually around the circle um, to a bunch of people. I'm going to energetically cast the circle myself and more of a, uh, so I guess it's more, a lot of Wiccans would also do this as well. Um, but I think most of us have a blade. I've seen people use their finger too. Um, in our circle, it was pretty open. Uh, it was not about being a high priestess or priestess. It was about, are you practicing magic? Are you a witch? Do you want to do this work? So you're inviting a lot of different people in. And that's a lot of different energies. And you, the circle cast is the first step in creating a sacred container. <clears throat> now, when I have, I have it on my altar in front of me, not behind me, but uh, uh, the head of garlic. The head of garlic is a... Um, a particularly nice one to use if you are um, interested in using plant magic more. And I've used that one a lot in when I lead my herbal rituals. It's a great herb to have on hand. Um, it's directly related to Hakate as being one of her offerings. And so it works really well to use later on as a um, offering to her. So person would, and usually I, t I typically um, pro tip is to use elephant garlic because it is easier to take apart. That being said, you're going to need more of it and it's more expensive. But ultimately it's going to the goddess Hakate and um, it's creating a circle of protection, a circle of trust where we all have offerings to give, um, whether we brought something or not. So with that, uh, our circles were not necessarily circle shaped because we had a small space and we had um, a large amount of people that would show up. So imagine um, we were in the Raven's Wing in Oakland, which is uh, not super big. It's a store. We would be surrounded around the table. We would have the table become the altar and we would move it back. But we'd had stacked rows of people. So we had to... Um, kind of metaphorically cast a circle within each of us so it would encompass the whole building so that we would be in this sacred space. Um, passing the garlic, each person would take off a clove. And I can tell you with elephant garlic, you maybe get like seven or eight through a head of garlic. So you'd need a few of those. Um, I think, you know, having more than enough is a better idea because you can always use it yourself. So um, people would pass the garlic and um, they would be, we'd have something like, um, I am in this circle, the circle is sacred, I am protected, I am in this circle. And there was always variations of that. Um, what we would write down in our ritual outlines would always shift to the energy of the ritual. So when you see a ritual outline, you don't have to follow it to the T, but you need to follow some kind of outline um, close enough, but also um, acknowledging the energies of the space and of the time and of the people that are in the space. And so that is um, that is the, the head of garlic. Like I said, buy quite a few heads because um, if, especially if you're using elephant garlic. And I like elephant garlic because you get meaty, um, substantial chunks of garlic that can be easily felt. Um, you can easily uh, use it and offer it to the goddess at a later portion in the ritual. So thank you for joining me for that. I am going to go through uh, each of the different parts of the book um, at my leisure. But I wanted to get through to the circle cast on the dark of the moon here because um, it's a good time to start 
So blessed be and thank you for listening.